brand new Intel 12th gen CPUs have landed. But do they make Intel competitive once again as the king of CPUs? I think they might just do. And to celebrate, we're going to be building a 12th gen build with the Core i9, an RTX 3080, and an insane PC case. In this video, I'll be running you through all the component choices I went for for this build, testing and benchmarking not only the whole system, but also the CPU to see how it stacks up against the i9s of last gen and the Ryzen 9s from AMD, as well as covering off the build process from start right through to finish. Let's dive into it though, after a quick ad from today's video sponsor. eBuyer is your one-stop shop for PC hardware and gaming gear here in the UK. With great deals on some of the latest tech, you won't want to miss out. Check out the UK links to all components in this video below at eBuyer. Plus, if you want to see more of me, take a look at their YouTube channel where I've been guest presenting a wide range of videos. From the latest tech to PC components and gear to supercharge your setup, check out eBuyer using the very first links in the description below. Now, for obvious reasons, I'm going to kick this build off by looking at our processors first of all, and then the motherboard, which Asus very kindly sent me in this insane unboxing experience. Intel were kind enough to send out these chips before launch. They haven't had pre-approval on this content or anything like that. It's just allowed us a great opportunity to evaluate their performance and make this content for you guys ready for launch day. They sent out the i5 and the i9, though for this build, I'll be using the i9. Pushing 12th gen to its max and seeing just what this brand new architecture is able to deliver. Crucially, these processors are intended to provide a step change in performance compared to 11th gen, which let's face it was essentially 10th gen minus a couple of cores with some faster clock speeds. From support for DDR5 to a smaller manufacturing process, a larger physical chip size, a lot has changed with these brand new CPUs. And in this video, I'll be looking at whether or not they're actually worth it. One thing I do like though already is the competitive pricing that Intel are pitching these at. Cheaper than a Ryzen 5 5600X for the i5 and cheaper than a Ryzen 9 5900 or 5950X, they're potentially an awesome choice. For these new processors though, we need to pick ourselves up some new memory. That's where this Corsair Vengeance DDR5 memory kit comes in with blazing fast speeds of 5200 megahertz. That's nearly like twice as fast as some of the DDR4 kits on the higher end when it first launched. So I'm excited to see what performance this is able to deliver. Of course, supports Intel XMP as well, which is pretty important for this system. In theory, DDR5 R5 is much faster and provides a lot more bandwidth, aiding our CPU. RAM is the most important factor in a system when it comes to getting solid processor performance. We'll come back to storage later because first I've got this. Now, a lot of brands have been very kind and lent us out hardware for our launch builds for Intel 12th gen and Asus are no different with this insane unboxing experience. I won't go into it in too much detail because we've already made a video unboxing Z5. I was about to say Z590, I mean Z690, which is of course the brand new chipset. Also in this box, Asus very kindly sent over a 360 millimeter cooler. This is not only very kind of them, but it's also pretty important because a lot of coolers won't support the Z690 Hero board out of the box. A few things about this cooler that stood out to me that are definitely worth mentioning is a partnership with Noctua. It actually uses Noctua fans, so should, I hope, be whisper quiet. It's got a six year warranty as well and uses an Acer Tech design. Pretty standard as far as coolers go. It's also got a screen on the CPU, which I believe we can change and tweak with in quite a lot of detail, so we will look at that later on. For now though, let's unbox the motherboard, get the CPU, the RAM, and the SSD installed, and we can worry about the cooler, case, power supply, and all that good stuff a little bit later. Installing the processor on a 12th gen CPU is a bit different. Pull the arm up like normal, but then fold out the socket from the top rather than the bottom. It's almost more like Threadripper than it actually is like a traditional Intel design. Not that I'm moaning, it's not a bad thing, it's just definitely something to keep in mind. It's a simple case, once again, of lining up your triangle Spoiler alert, for us, we're gonna go down to the bottom left of the socket, drop it in nicely, give it a little bit of a wiggle before popping uh, that cover back down, tightening it on, and then this black plastic cover will pop off nice and easily. The CPU is a larger design than previous, so that's definitely something to keep in mind, but it fits nice and easily, and I quite like this socket design, actually. I am a big AMD socket fan, but Intel, good work on this one. I'll be pairing this up, as I already mentioned, with a 32 gig RAM kit from Corsair. This is their more entry-level option, though we've also covered their Dominator Platinum 
RGB or we'll be covering it in an upcoming video, including an awesome chopping board that Corsair has sent to celebrate DDR5's cutting edge performance. This kit doesn't have any RGB on it or anything like that, but this is kind of intended to be an all black build and there's plenty of other RGB to go around. In fact, this Asus logo actually lights up in a really cool pixel design, which I like a lot. We're going to be installing the RAM into the second and into the fourth RAM DIMM slot, slide it in nice and easily, bit of pressure, and it will click in. Beware that DDR5 and DDR4 aren't compatible on the same motherboards. They physically won't fit. So if you want to go for a DDR4 board, pick up a DDR4 memory for that board. If you want a DDR5 board, make sure you get the right RAM. I like this memory, super low profile, looks super sleek actually. And their Corsair are killing it at the moment. I think we can all agree. Some really, really cool products, including a liquid cooler with a screen that we featured recently. Awesome stuff. As I say though, we're also going to be adding in some storage today. This is, oh dear, this is CK. This is the third video I've filmed today, guys, okay? Give me some strength. This is the Fire Cuda 530. It's a two terabyte NVMe drive with market leading speeds. The 530 is just the best Gen 4 drive on the market. We all know this. Look at the benchmarks, look at the results we're able to achieve, and it really is pretty undeniable. If you're not quite so fussed about write speeds, you can save yourself a bit of money and pick up uh, the WD drive or the Samsung drive, but if you want seven gigabytes read and write the 530 is absolutely the one I would recommend picking up. For this step you'll need to throw away your large screwdriver and pick up one of its smaller. This teeny tiny screwdriver that Deepcool sent me will work perfectly and we're going to uninstall this top M.2 slot. You can see here we've got one little screw on the left hand side of the heatsink cover, a little bit stiff actually, and then we've got another one on the other side and taking this off should reveal our M.2 slot. Remember of course as well when you pop this back on to take off the thermal pad on the bottom, this is what's going to make contact with the SSD allow for an efficient transfer of heat and keep your system as cool as a cucumber because cucumbers nowadays are very cool ladies and gents. Anyway ladies and gents <laughs> to install the uh, SSD into the board normally it's a simple case of sliding it in like this and popping it back down. Now that is still the case in this system but it appears Asus have added whatever on earth this kind of plastic fastener is. I think the idea is that it makes SSD installation toolless so let's give that a go. Drive sort of looks upside down but that's okay slide it in and then maybe twist. What the hell does this work? Asus, I have not got a clue. Can we get a nice close up of this, Dan? Um, I have not got a foggy, the foggiest idea how this works. Asus, I really love what you've done with the tallest design on this board overall. I love the fact that you've added this button to release the PCI slot, but that, that doesn't work. That needs, um, that needs a little bit of improvement, I think, because all I've ended up doing is mashing the thermal pad with the screwdriver, and it's just a bit, the screw is perfectly adequate in that situation. Sorry, Asus, I like the idea, but on this occasion, it's, uh, it's a no from me. Once we've navigated the M.2 system that Asus have put into place, we can go ahead and move the motherboard into the case. That was a bit of rhyme from me there. This is the Link Unity Codex. And full disclaimer, we have got this in for a sponsored video project soon, but this video is not that. This is like a bonus video because I really like the look of the case and wanted something a bit insane to kick off our 12th gen Intel coverage. It kind of looks a little bit like the Lee and Lee O11D, like the big one. So that's quite interesting, but a bit more angry, a bit more gamery, and to really, really match the aesthetic of the Asus motherboard. So let me unbox it and I'll be right back once we've gone ahead and done that. We're gonna give you a let you down. With it out of the box, I think you can probably see why I wanted to use this case so much. It's kind of like a fish tank editor, Dan said, and I think he's right. I've never seen a case where it actually does glass to glass as well. I really, really, really like the way that looks. There's also like a radiator mount that's on show, so maybe that's where we use our Asus ROG Ryogen, Ryogen cooler. Who knows? There's also fan mounts at the bottom, so we can have loads and loads of airflow. I'm probably going to kit this thing out with a load of Corsair LL RGB fans or something like that. As ever though, before we do any of that, we need to go ahead and just remove the side panels. I thought these were thumb screws, they're not. They're really nicely polished screws for the glass side panel. So go ahead and do this, take this side panel off, probably remove the rear panel as well, move all the glass out of the way so we don't be clumsy and smash it. Then we can install the motherboard. Just a quick note as well while I'm here, have a look at the back of this motherboard and look how dense the PCB is. One sign of a great motherboard is just how many connectors and conductors and chips and stuff it's got on the back. It really, really shows you when a brand has gone to the max in making 
making their motherboard as cool and as feature packed as possible. We're gonna go ahead though and actually slide our motherboard into the case, a little something like this, before actually fastening it down. In this chassis, we've only got two screws at the top, two across the middle and two along the bottom, as with these ones here, there's probably not quite enough room to fasten them in securely. So go ahead, screw your motherboard in and that's pretty much it as far as your motherboard and your case goes, allowing us to move on to this right here, which is none of that than our CPU cooler. The Asus Ryogen cooler is a really, really interesting proposition. The partnership with Noctua is one that fascinates me personally, and I do like how Asus are going more and more into other components, from cases to coolers to power supplies. We've covered quite a lot of them here on the channel, and overall they seem to do a pretty good job, so hopefully this is no exception. As far as the installation goes though, I think I've just about gone ahead and figured it out. I always recommend starting off with the radiator. For us, we're going to just pop it in this portion of the case here. That will make it nicely on show, and our Noctua fans should look pretty good. They aren't RGB, but they will be whisper quiet. So I think that's a trade-off I'm willing to make, and we can pop some RGB fans at the bottom instead. Go ahead and actually screw your radiator in and add the fans on, and then we'll deal with the water block just afterwards. The water block is more complicated, but once you've got the back plate and all the pieces you need, it shouldn't be too tricky. To do this, you just need to go ahead and take this back plate, and then this collection of male-to-male -male screws and thumb screws. These are actually what we're going to go ahead and fasten into the back plate with the cooler sandwiched in the middle. Back plate first, male to male post second, cooler third, and then our thumb screws fourth. Remember, of course, as well, to drop on a dab of thermal paste if your cooler's not brand new or it didn't come with it pre-applied. Not too much though, because too much thermal paste, believe it or not, is actually a bad thing. Next up then on our list today is the graphics card. The cooler's in and looking pretty good. I'm excited to see how the screen looks later as well. I thought I was gonna be more upset by the lack of RGB yeah. fans than I actually am on the cooler. I think the all black Noctua's look super stealthy and I'm so glad that Noctua have finally made some fans that aren't brown or grey, that are all stealthy, all plain black. They look sick. Maybe Noctua next, you can make some RGB fans. Somehow, I'm not entirely convinced that that is going to happen. Continuing our theme of sort of minimal with not too much RGB, the graphics card. This is the Asus TUF RTX 3080 Gaming. I love the lineup of TUF cards from Asus, though to be honest, in the current climate, any GPU you can get hands on with at a decent price point is what you probably realistically should go and buy. I'll be installing it into our case today nice and easily. Uh, you do get a vertical GPU mount, but I think I'm gonna keep it simple, just go horizontal for this system, add some RGB fans at the bottom and use the space that way. As you can see, we're going to install it into our top PCIe slot. And now's a good opportunity to showcase a really cool feature that Asus have included with this motherboard. You can actually go ahead and release the GPU with this button over here. It connects via a cable to the PCI retention clip and pushes it back. Great for easily taking out a GPU from a build. For this system, we need to go ahead and remove a couple of the PCI lanes though. I think for us, it is lanes two and three. Take those out and then we can go ahead and clip the graphics card in. Click it into place by sliding it into the slot, applying a bit of pressure. There we go, and then we can fasten the GPU back down. Once that's done, we only have one component left to actually go, and that is the power supply. This right here is also from Colink, and this is their Enclave 700 watt. You might want to jump up to like an 800 watt power supply for this build thinking about it, but I think for us, this will work pretty well. It is fully modular as well, meaning you only plug in the cables that you need, and I'll link some great power supply options for lots of different regions and retailers at the affiliate links down in the description below. A bit of a heads up, this video won't be a full cables and wiring guide. But to give you a bit of a heads up, we need a 24 pin motherboard power connector. That's the largest of the bunch with one end going to the power supply and one end to the motherboard. We need a dual six plus two pin PCIe harness to give our graphics card PCIe power. And we also need one or two of these. This is an eight pin CPU power connector that will actually power up the processor in the top left hand side of our motherboard today. Go ahead and get all those cables plugged up and the system is pretty much ready to go. If you'd like to find a full cables and wiring guide, you can check out that in the card section now in another video that we made over on the channel and make sure to get subscribed while you're at it if you aren't already because a lot of you that watch on a regular basis have not yet hit that button and make sure to turn on notifications as well so you never miss a future upload that is looking absolutely awesome all that's left to do is pop in a couple of rgb fans at the bottom close up those side panels and boot the system up to finally check out the performance of this brand new 12th gen core i9 12900k before that though it's time to see how good this awesome system system locks in an epic glam montage in the only way we know how here on the channel. I'll see you in a second for the benchmarks, but first roll that montage. <laughs> Headphone warning. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now that we've seen just how good the system looks, it's time to find out how well this new i9 CPU performs when paired up with an Asus TUF 3080. On your screen now is a summary, a snapshot of all the different numbers we were able to achieve in a wide range of titles, over 15 of the latest and most popular AAA games. You can also find our dedicated review video now live in the card section now, features benchmarks like Cinebench and Ida64. But for now, I'm going to take a look at some of these gaming titles and their performance in closer detail. The first of those games is GTA 5. We always test this title for good reason. It's a great test that is repeatable, it's something you guys can try at home, and it's really predictable. Here we got some of the best results we've ever had from a 3080. In fact, the best. 161 frames per second on average to be precise. 90 and 99th percentile results were strong, showing the game performed consistently well. It was a similar story in what Watch Dogs Legion, where at 4K very high settings, we achieved just shy of 90 frames a second. 86 FPS to be precise. This higher resolution really shows you what you can achieve with the maximum settings, and visually, I think the game looked absolutely awesome. It's a similar story with Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War. In the multiplayer zombies mode, we broke through 100 frames per second at 4K high settings with RTX and DLSS enabled. Admittedly, ray tracing and DLSS are more down to the graphics card, but pushing the entire system to its limits is what we aim to do with this gaming test. It was a similarly positive story in Apex Legends, where once again at 4K high settings we achieved 120 frames a second, or 119 uh, to be precise. Now some of you might be wondering why we're testing so aggressively at that 4K resolution. The reason is because this gives you a worst case scenario. If you jump down to 1440p or heck even 1080p, your results and mileage will increase significantly. Valorant though is a game that you'll never need to run at anything less than 4K to get esports frame rates. At 4K high we got 300 and 26 frames per second. Wow. The game visually looked great as well. Valorant, an easier to run title, but still a great test of any system. The next game is perhaps the opposite to Valorant in that it's so difficult to run. It is none other than Cyberpunk. Here at 4K medium settings with ray tracing also enabled and set to medium, we got just shy of 60 frames per second on average with 54 and 50 for the 90 and the 99th percentile result. Finally then, the last game on our focus title list today is Call of Duty Warzone. At 4K high settings, we we got 105 frames per second on average, with 94 and 89 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. As ever, our frame rates were captured with both MSI Afterburners Reva Tuner and Nvidia Frame View to give a really even, consistent picture of the results. With that though, that just about wraps it up for the gaming benchmarks today, and by extension, the whole video. If you enjoyed this one, make sure to give it a big old like rating, get subscribed if you'd like to see more from us. Thanks for tuning in though, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.